Hey, it's Brandon. Welcome to Transform Your Workplace. This episode is sponsored by Swanson Health. Swanson Health is the only company to offer the full spectrum of wellness products for mind, body, and home. From quality vitamins and supplements to cruelty-free beauty items to eco-friendly home products, Swanson Health is here to keep you healthy. Swanson Health only supports products they're proud to use and give to their own families, backing everything by strict quality standards with the Swanson Quality Code. Swanson Health carries over 20,000 wellness products at a great value. And in fact, I got a chance to use several of the products from ones that I've already used like Burt's Bees hand cream to new ones like the probiotics by Swanson Health. And I was so happy to use those products and they're, and they're great. So pick up all of your favorite health products, plus discover new ones for your wellness routine, all while leaving money in your pocket. If you want to try any of Swanson Health's great products for yourself, use code WORK20 for 20% off on Swanson.com. That's code WORK20 for 20% off on Swanson.com. Now on to the show. Hey, welcome back to Transform Your Workplace. Thanks for tuning in for today's episode. Got an exciting episode today, but first, what I want to tell you is that we're doing at Zenium our annual What People Want from Work Report survey. What's great about this, the timing's probably perfect. You've probably got employees working from home, stressed out, burned out, all of the above. So this is your opportunity to ask them what they want out of work how you responded to the health crisis as an organization, and so much more. Go to zenimhr.com forward slash what people want from work, and you can get all the details and sign up for free there. It is free. You get a basic report for free. You can upgrade to a premium report, which gives you a lot of extra benchmarking data and whatnot, but like literally participation is 100% free. doesn't matter where you're located. So join us for that. We've always got a lot of participation. Okay, on to today's episode. Today's guest is Steve Glaveski. He's the author of Time Rich, Do Your Best Work, Live Your Best Life. For me, I'm a humongous self-help junkie, for lack of a better word. I can't get enough of like trying to optimize my time and my health and, and all of the above. So, and, and I feel like right now, many of you, many of your employees probably need something like this right now. So that's why I'm offering that. It's kind of different from what we normally do, but we talk about looking at screens all day, commuting, running errands, and uh, just so much more about like how we spend our time and why we always feel like we're not so time rich as Steve mentions in the book and in the podcast. So I think you're going to get a lot out of this. Uh, We had a great conversation just about mental health and productivity. So enjoy the episode. Reach out to me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, anywhere (laughs) that you're on social media. I'm probably there. I'd love to hear from you. Enjoy the episode. Hey, Steve, thanks for coming on the podcast. Good to have you. Thanks for having me, Brandon. Yeah, your new book, Time Rich, Work Smarter, Live Better. What made you start writing this book? It's my kind of book, the self-help, like time hacking. It is totally written for me, but why'd you start doing that? Yeah, I mean, the original seed of the idea went back to an experiment that I ran with my team at Collective Campus. So we're a a boutique innovation accelerator. And we found ourselves just anchoring to the past in a way, just working the way I had worked in the corporate world for 10 years, long hours, 12 hour days, all that sort of stuff. But I kind of thought, look, I don't need to be doing this anymore. I mean, I built a company to get away from the corporate world, yet I find myself anchoring to the past and just putting in place all these cultural norms that mimic the way things were there. So I decided that 
we would run a two-week experiment. And during this experiment, we would pull back the workday to six hours. And because of that, it would act as a forcing function whereby we would need to focus only on high-level tasks. And anything else that was rudimentary or process-oriented, we would need to automate or outsource. We would also need to do away with a lot of the things that steal our focus, such as unnecessary meetings, such as checking email every five to 10 minutes. And once this experiment concluded, we found that we were just as, if not more productive than we were previously. And so I was inspired to write about this for Harvard Business Review in an article called The Case for the Six-Hour Workday. That article was then syndicated by the Wall Street Journal and numerous other publications around the world. And so I spoke to my publisher at the time, uh, Wiley, and said, hey, this article just blew up. I think there's interest in (laughs) this. And it turned into a 70,000 word book. It's like controversial, right? It's like, oh, wow, we can't shorten work hours because then we get paid less and then or people won't be productive. And I worry about productivity output and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I imagine you had a lot of people probably ripping it apart (laughs) as much as probably loved what you said, right? Oh, man, so many. I recall one person on LinkedIn when I first shared the HBR article saying, sounds great in theory, but I could never get all of my tasks done in six hours. And you know, within that comment, there is an assumption that all of your tasks are created equal. One thing that I'm sure many of your listeners would be familiar with is the 80-20 Pareto principle, which shows that 20% of your inputs are responsible for 80% of your outputs. And it's the same thing with your task. I mean, if you sit down to your desk at the start of the day and you've got a to-do list with, say, 10 things on it, chances are there's maybe two or three of those things that are way more valuable than the other seven. But oftentimes we find ourselves falling victim to evolutionary programming and doing the easiest thing first because our brains are wired to conserve energy. So instead of starting our day with, say, the two to three difficult tasks, we'll start our day with email, with LinkedIn with all these little inconsequential things that don't really add up to much value, but make us feel like we're actually being busy. And we can spend all our day on what I call and what others have called uh, insecurity work. And then come, say, 5 p.m., we have very little to show for it other than the fact that we've been, quote unquote, busy all day. There's a quote I love from the introduction of the book, and it says, As we'll learn, it's not just about making people more productive in the office, but about freeing up precious hours for living life, which paradoxically Mm -hmm. has positive effect on performance in the office. End quote. I love that because it does summarize kind of why you probably wrote this book in the first place. It's like, let's free up some time so we can actually live life and enjoy, whether it's our family or doing new things, hobbies, learning, whatever it may be. And in turn, it's probably going to make you productive in the office because you're there for maybe a shorter amount of time, you got a laser focus. And how do you think about it? Well, if you look at the the statistics, I mean, the average person spends about 70% of their waking hours looking at screens, commuting or running errands, Mm -hmm. which doesn't leave much for living life. And when we are, say, with our family or with our friends or, or whoever the case may be, we aren't bringing our best selves because we're absolutely exhausted from all the other things we've got going on. And when we actually spend less time in the office, when we have more time to invest in our personal relationships, our physical health, our mental health, we actually become more productive in the office. And there's studies that back this claim. There was one study which found that scientists working 35 hours a week were half as productive as those that were working 20 hours a week. There's examples of people like Charles Darwin who came up with the groundbreaking theory of evolution, and he would work five hours a day, and that included one hour for lunch. The reason for this is the modern workday in many organizations is a throwback to the Industrial Revolution. I think it was 1937, the Fair Labor Standards Act ratified the eight-hour workday, but there's one really big fundamental difference between then and now. Back then, you were potentially sitting or standing on an assembly line or in a coal mine, Basically, the hours in conflated with the output that you would generate. So it was all about putting widgets into boxes, so to speak. But as work has evolved, people like your listeners, people like yourself, people like me, a large chunk of our work requires thinking. It's heuristic work. It's not algorithmic work. And when it comes to thinking work that requires us to, say, get into flow, 
our brains can only get into that state for about four hours a day. And thereafter, our cognition tapers off very, very quickly. The difficulty is with so many organizations, the way they actually operate, their employees don't even have one hour to get into that deep work state because they're being interrupted 50 to 60 times a day. And if they're not being interrupted by smartphone notifications or other people tapping them on the shoulder or inviting them to meetings, they're interrupting themselves because they're just voluntarily checking email over 70 times a day or jumping into their phone voluntarily because they're like, oh, I'll just jump into Instagram for five minutes while I'm putting this proposal together. But if you were actually focused on something, it can take you up to 23 minutes to get back in the zone. And so over the course of the day, with all of these task switching going on, you basically end up spending 10 hours doing something that could have taken you four hours if you were focused on the task at hand and not switching every five minutes. And that switching also means we end up feeling exhausted by the end of the day, so much so that, again, we go home and there's not much left other than cognitive scraps to invest in our personal relationships. You give a really good history lesson of work within the book and you go back a couple hundred years and talk about how you know we might be doing manual labor for 16 hours a day, whereas now mm -hmm. we were stuck on this eight-hour workday, which seems so bizarre because we've been stuck in this for probably almost 100 years. Where is this all going? Do you think people are starting to listen to people like you who've actually done studies and are looking at this very intimately and saying like, look, we need more space to think because we're knowledge workers. We need to work less, not more. Like, are people actually mm. starting to adapt to that? I think organizations will either have to adapt or will find themselves behind in some respects because what happens is if you have an organization where you have to attend lots of pointless meetings, whereby you don't have the mental freedom to focus on a task for more than an hour without being interrupted, where you can't do your best work, but there are other organizations out there where you can, well, the smartest people, the most driven and ambitious people are going to seek out those organizations. And then over time, those organizations who have these awesome people on the bus who create a culture whereby people can actually think, which is what they're being paid to do, will inevitably end up ahead. So organizations will either have to adapt to this new reality or find themselves on the out. And I think we're slowly starting to see that with the shift in work in the last, say, 10 to 15 years, whereby we have a big push on the entrepreneurial side, a lot more companies starting up. I mean, the whole startup ecosystem is really something whereby thanks to lower technological barriers to entry, lower financial barriers to entry. We've just seen a boom over the last 10 years or so. We're seeing so many billions of dollars being invested into startup companies. And so these organizations are starting to, I think, lead a bit of a narrative shift. We've seen companies like Automatic. So Matt Mullenweg's been on the warpath on this topic about particularly distributed teams. But then you have people like Jason Fried over at Basecamp, who's written books like It Doesn't Need to Be Crazy at Work. I think slowly but surely the message is getting across. And sometimes in life, you need to face a really big setback or some kind of unexpected occurrence to really reflect on how you're living and make some significant changes. And I'm hoping that you know COVID-19, for all its drawbacks and negative downstream effects, will get leaders in organizations to really reflect on how they were doing things before and shift new realities. But what I'm seeing a lot of typical traditional large organizations do with remote work, for example, is just recreating the office online. So instead of having five one-hour meetings with 10 people in the meeting that don't serve to achieve all that much in the office, we're doing that via Zoom now. And uh, instead of giving people the opportunity to redesign how they work and give them more freedom to do away with interruptions and actually get more high-quality work done, we're just recreating the office online. So look, I think with any significant changes, it takes time. It's like the uh, technology adoption curve. You have your early adopters, you have your early majority, your late majority, and then your laggards. And I think with a lot of big bureaucratic traditional organizations, they are the laggards and either they will adapt or like I said, they will perish. One stat that you had in your book that I thought was insane and just eye-opening, you said according to the World Economic Forum, 65% of children entering primary school today will end up working in jobs that aren't even on our radar yet. 
And it's like, wow, at a time like this where most of us are at home, it's even more eye-opening too because you kind of see with the technological shift, it's like, okay, work has to be all of a sudden done differently. Now some jobs are more important than others. And it's like, okay, Mm -hmm. you know, kids and even people who are entering the workforce, it seems like, wow, things could shift even faster in the next five, 10 years. And how do you think about what the future holds for work and just the way people are going to be spending their time? Yeah, it's a great question. And there's another stat that might blow some minds, which is that 85% of jobs that will exist in 2030 haven't been invented yet. And that's from the Institute wow. for the Future. So that's only 10 years away, right? And uh, look, projections are projections. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. But I dare say that Many jobs, an overwhelming number of jobs that exist in 10 years uh, haven't been invented yet. And you know what? That's not a really uh, far out claim because if you look at, say, many of the jobs that exist today and go back maybe 15, 20 years, they didn't exist back then, particularly in light of all the new technologies that basically pervade our lives. So in terms of where work is going, it's a great question and there is no one answer to this, but It will require us to focus more on, say, skills of the future as they're known, complex problem solving, critical thinking, emotional intelligence is a big one, service orientation, creativity, cognitive flexibility. I think these are the kinds of things that will mean that people can essentially survive changes and they can adapt to changes in the work environment rather than specializing in one thing that may tomorrow become automated. Um, There's stats in the book around accounting and audit, for example, which faces a 93.5% chance of being automated. So I'm glad I got out of that profession because I used to be an auditor at EY and KPMG a few years ago. It looks like I made it out just in time. But then professions like paralegals, real estate agents, and so on face in excess of an 85% chance of being automated. So I think going forward, we might see shorter work days, which I would love to see. And the reason I say that is because with the development of technology, we're finding that more and more of what humans once did, we'll be able to automate. And therefore, we won't need to work 10 hour or 12 hour mm-hmm. days. We might work four hour days. And that's a great thing. And that requires a cultural shift. I think the technology is already there. If you look at automation tools in general, I mean, the price of them has come down something like 100x in the last 10 years. And I tell a story in the book about my nephew. When he was 15 years old, I used to have him doing a little bit of outreach for us. So he'd jump onto LinkedIn. I'd say, okay, here's the filter. You got to find people who work in HR at these companies. And then he'd do this copy paste, change the first name, change the company's name, email maybe 100 people. And then a few months later, I found this tool, uh, I think it was Linked Helper, and it would do the thing for like $10 a month and it would contact 100 people a day. And I had to give him the bad news and tell him that he was out of his job. (laughs) (laughs) No nepotism here. But uh, yeah, so I think there is no one answer to that, but there will be no room, I think, for mediocrity. And and that's also echoing something that uh, Alec Ross, uh, former a technology advisor to Barack Obama I wrote a great book called Industries of the Future said, you know, in a world where many rudimentary tasks can be automated, there is no room for mediocrity. You know, I mentioned accountants and auditors. In those industries, I'm not saying that those industries will be completely wiped out, but technology can do the majority of the work, but you will still need people to review the output, to maintain relationships, to do the human stuff, but you won't need a firm of a thousand people. You might need 50. I'm reading this book right now called Range. It's by David Epstein. And he talks about this point too. It's <laughs> like you over specialize in certain areas. And it's like at some point you're at risk of potentially being outsourced, automated or whatever. And maybe your skills won't be needed in the future. And, and so having like a wide range of skills, they don't have to be super deep, but just your curious mind, learning new things and a wide range of skill set is going to really set you up yeah. for the future. So It's I, a really great book. Yeah. So you've read it? Yeah, yeah. I read it recently. I'm a big fan of his work. And I think one of the key points to make when it comes to generalists versus specialists is it pays to be a specialist in environments of certainty where things aren't changing. You can double down. And I think if you look at the way a lot of organizations have been built, particularly more traditional ones, is they have very, very rigid processes in place. 
And those processes exist to help them just deliver on an existing repeatable business model. But once the world changes, those processes, they become your undoing. Mm -hmm. It's like the assembly line helps you become efficient, but if the world changes, then you're efficient at doing the wrong thing. And when the world's changing quite quickly, as is the case today, then it pays to be a generalist and to be across some of those skills that I mentioned earlier, because that's going to help you know, last or adapt to all of these changes. One of the points that you made in the book that was so profound and it illustrates your point really well in this discussion is you said you won't be able to simply coast anymore. Organizations will be mm-hmm. looking to optimize for performance in a way that they've never had to before. And, and I think this goes both ways, I think, because organizations will have to keep fine tuning what they do so they can survive in a really crazy, changing, evolving work environment. But also employees, in order to keep their skills up, they're going to have to change too. They can't coast by anymore like they used to. You're not staying at a company 20, 30 years anymore and getting that gold watch or whatever it is. You're going to have to develop skills and optimize your time for performance, right? Oh, well, 100%. I mean, there's a law I mentioned in the book called Price's Law, uh, which finds that the square root of a company's headcount generally creates 50% of the value. So if you're a team of 100, chances are 10 people are creating 50% of the value. Now, up until now, you may have gotten away with doing a somewhat mediocre job, particularly as organizations were riding a wave ever since the post-World War II, riding a bit of financial boom, if you will, notwithstanding a couple of setbacks such as the GFC and the 1987 stock market crash. But notwithstanding that, what we've also done is we've built these organizations whereby people like to outsource accountability. And so we've had large teams of people, you would often call lots of meetings. And the purpose of those meetings was to outsource accountability instead of take ownership. So the more people you had, the more you could spread the blame around and the ownership around. And that essentially helps people allay themselves of any insecurities they might have about their own abilities. But with the nature of work changing with prices law, and as a leader myself, what I've seen in my own organization is we've also scaled back in terms of employees. So we had 15 in our core team a couple of years ago, in addition to about 50 consultants and facilitators around the world. And we've scaled that back to five because we found that over the last two years alone, the number of tools that have come along that have enabled us to effectively, for better or worse, make certain types of jobs redundant or offshore them it's almost impossible to justify keeping those roles on. And unless they can adapt and provide different types of value that only human beings can provide, then it's a competitive decision that leaders need to make in order to stay ahead of the curve. And you may not want to make such decisions, but if every other company is doing so, then they're going to have a massive competitive advantage over you when it comes to their margins and how they operate, how much they can charge for their services. So you're going to have to change. And I think Ilva Johansson, she was the employment minister in Sweden two years ago. I'm not sure if she still occupies that position, but she said something really good about the way they manage their economy, which was, we will protect the workers, but we will not protect the jobs. So their whole thing is, we want to reskill people. We want them to adapt to the changes. It's not about protecting jobs as such, because then you're just anchoring to the past and that's not natural. I mean- Evolution is about adapting, changing, moving forward, and people need to do that as well. It's a matter of taking personal responsibility for where you end up. Love that. Let's shift over to some of the tools that you provide as far as like optimizing time. And one thing that I thought was really fascinating, you talk about early birds and night owls. So the quote that I pulled out says, we shouldn't feel demonized for getting up late or working late. If you're going to demonize anything, let it be failing to live up to your potential, whether that be as an early bird or a night owl, end quote. And you basically go on to say that like, given the fact that 30 to 40% of the people are night owls, the current workday, 9 to 5, is really killing creativity. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, like wake up to this point that everybody's, you know, <laughs> their flow state is probably <laughs> in different points of the day or they're just not getting that yet. <laughs> I don't think they're getting that yet. (laughs) And (laughs) based on the conversations I've had, like I've rattled off that statistic to a number of people now. And every time, yeah, every time people are like, what, really? That's insane. Like nobody's 
coming back and saying, oh yeah, I know that. That's common knowledge. So most organizations still haven't even started reorganizing around creating time to get into the flow state, let alone accounting for the fact that different people who have these different chronotypes. So some people are early birds, other people are night owls. And one thing about that is with the night owls, if you're getting them to wake up early and get to work, then they ultimately suffer from a form of social jet lag. And the night owls are actually more productive 10 hours after waking up than the early birds that tend to be productive, say, an hour or two after waking up. So it can be quite devastating when you think about the fact that you might have an organization, say you're a large bank with 10,000 employees and maybe three to 4,000 of those employees are night owls who are just not being anywhere near optimized as much as they could be. So it's an interesting point, but I, I don't foresee that being anything that organizations will organize around in the near future. However, if companies do acknowledge this fact that People are at their best when they are given autonomy and freedom to make choices, when we don't over-optimize for meetings, when we give them more time to design their own days, then you're creating a bit more space for that. And it might not be that night owls start work at, say, 3 p.m. or 5 p.m., but it might be that they have the opportunity to start at, say, 11. And that way you still have an overlap of the day with your early birds. Maybe there's a three to four hour overlap, so you can still communicate important information. But that way, you're not forcing night owls to get out of bed at like 6 or 7 a.m. and you know, suffer the social jet lag that comes with that. So besides working when we shouldn't be because of whether we're an early bird or a night owl, what are some other like flow killers that you've run across, whether it's interruptions or things like that? Like, What have you seen? Well, there's two things. External interruptions. Mm-hmm. So your smartphone notifications <laughs> is one and desktop notifications being two. So the average person gets between 60 and 70 notifications a day. And if all you do is just glance at that notification, you don't even tap your phone to check out what that message is all about. You just glance at it. Studies show that even a one-tenth of a second task switch, so just glancing at that notification over the course of the day can add up to a 40% dip in productivity. So it still can amount to a task switch, still can get you out of flow, and it still does mean that you suffer those penalties when it comes back in flow. And it's the same with your online notifications. So it's funny. I mean, I love using Slack, but I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with it. You know, it's quite easy for us to conflate downloading Slack and Zoom and saying, we've got this remote working thing sorted out, but a tool is only as good as how you use it. And it can be your undoing when it comes to productivity. And you know, it was just a few weeks ago, I was in Slack and it popped up with a notification saying, you really should turn on your notifications. And I thought, no, I shouldn't. <laughs> no way to hell, because I'm just going to be suffering these little micro tasks, which is all freaking day. And not only that, but then I'm going to have this little red dot there while I'm trying to say, write an article or put together a proposal to do some work. And it's just going to be bugging me. So I'm just going to have to click on Slack and see what's up in there. So those external notifications are quite, quite, quite terrible. We are our own worst enemies in some respects. And a lot of notifications, if you will, internal to us. So we might be working on something and then think, oh, I wonder what so-and-so is doing. Let me go and see. And I'll jump into WhatsApp and send off a quick message. And that requires building discipline. And you're working on something that is, say, one of those one to three tasks that are at the very top of your list, the high level tasks, cultivating, say, an hour where you're just going to work on those tasks and you're not going to do anything else. You're free of interruptions. So you're in a physical space where you can't be interrupted. Your phone's in airplane mode. Notifications are turned off on your desktop, on your phone. Maybe your phone's not even next to you. It's in another room. And therefore, that desire to just reach for it is suppressed. And then you focus. And then at the end of that hour, you can reward yourself. You can go off. You can send a few messages, you can scroll on Instagram for a couple of minutes, and then you get back to work. And I think the more you cultivate workflow like that, the easier it becomes. And you will find that over time it compounds and you get so much more done than what you would if you were kind of not being intentional about how you work throughout the day. You wrote that we should stop treating all decisions as if they're type one decisions. Explain what type one and type two decisions are, and then why should we focus more on the type two decisions? Or I guess it's not even necessarily that. It's more just like stop treating all decisions as the type one. Maybe just elaborate Mm -hmm. on that point. 
It's a great question. And that comes out of Jeff Bezos's shareholder letters. <laughs> a type one decision essentially is a big, hairy, audacious, irreversible decision. So type one decisions, yes, you should have a meeting. You should bring in domain experts across different areas, technologists, strategists, marketers, sales guys, you name it, bring them in. Let's have a conversation. Let's get all the insights on the table because this decision, once it's been made, we can't reverse it and it might cost us millions of dollars. Now, type two decisions, on the other hand, are decisions which are small, inconsequential, and reversible. And those types of decisions Oftentimes, if you get them wrong, you actually learn something. There is utility to those decisions. And so it's not about making the right or wrong decisions, it's just about learning from it and moving forward with that information as quickly as possible. Now, the thing is, most of our decisions are type two decisions, but we treat most of them as type one decisions. So we're always calling meetings. We're always looping in five, six people. We're always doing these reply all Mm. emails to seven or eight people, which is just interrupting their flow because they've got more emails to look through now and respond to. And not only that, but we're creating bottlenecks because the faster we make a decision, the faster we get to an outcome. But if we're treating every decision like a type one, that means that we're always having these meetings. We're always having to seek out approval. It means we slow down the rate that our business operates on. And again, if we're in a competitive landscape where we're competing with organizations who have this stuff down pat, Like they're moving quickly. They're treating type one decisions as type ones, type twos as type twos. They're not having unnecessary meetings. They're not being interrupted all day. They're focusing on the high level tasks. They're automating and outsourcing all the rudimentary stuff. I mean, how much further do you think those companies are going to be in a year versus the organization that's pontificating in a boardroom all the time? Every time a little, you know, unnecessary decision needs to be made, right? So that's the difference. And I think, like I said earlier, companies will either adapt or they'll be forced out of the market by virtue of these competitive pressures. You said that increasing value and decreasing bureaucracy is the way to build a time-rich culture. What are some ways to increase value and then also at the same time decrease the bureaucracy? Maybe some examples of those would be great. Sure. So, I mean, I call this a minimum viable bureaucracy. Basically, borrowing from the term uh, minimum viable product from the lean startup, but essentially it's increased value. I mean, you do things like stretching your product's S-curve, which is, you know, can you repurpose your product? Can you target different customer segments? Can you bundle up your product? Can you unbundle it? Can you deliver it through different channels rather than just face-to-face? Maybe there's online channels you can explore, you know, leveraging customer referrals, increasing your marketing spend on high-performing products, all those types of things. So these are the things that are going to say you're making money on a product. You've made $10,000 last month, let's say, hypothetically. Doing these things can help you to tap into new markets and just ramp that up to, say, fifteen or 20000 I mean, that's the argument there on stretching the S-curve. And then in terms of decreasing the bureaucracy, you're looking at things like automating those rudimentary processes, outsourcing any processes and tasks that can't be automated yet. You want to decrease the number of people required to make type two decisions because, like I said, otherwise you're going to end up with bottlenecks and that slows you down. A practical thing organizations could do is lower what many companies call delegations of authority, which really just relates to if I need to allocate $5,000 of capital into something, how many approvals do I need to seek? And in some organizations, $1,000 investment requires you getting signed off by three people. So that means that these small investments are going to take time to get signed off, particularly if people aren't into the office, they've got other commitments, you can't coordinate that. What you want to do is lower delegations of authority. So maybe people, individuals can make decisions up to a certain amount of money. That means they can make those decisions quicker. You want to also focus on Something Peter Drucker said, which was, there's nothing worse than the wrong things done right. Mm. And companies sometimes overthink things. You know, like we build the 100 button remote control when really all we need is maybe four or five buttons. So these are really just things that require us to be way more intentional about how we work. And another thing I would just add to that, I mean, there are other things which I talk about in the book, but another thing that I just wanted to highlight was just working with external parties uh, rather than trying to do absolutely everything yourself finding complementary parties outside the building to work with. And you know, I talk about COSA's law, 
or Coase's theorem in the book, which was penned in the 1930s by Ronald Coase. And back then, he found that external transaction costs for complex activities, so having to work with external parties, was a lot more costly than internal transaction costs because you had to account for search, valuation, onboarding, all this sort of stuff, which you didn't really need to do with internal employees. So what would happen was companies would continue to hire people internally, and inevitably the size of a firm would grow and grow and grow. But nowadays, thanks to technology, we have seen that the cost of engaging external parties for complex tasks has come crashing down. And so now organizations who are more proficient at doing that can find that we can onboard awesome talent for short periods of time to help us with something very specific, (laughs) and then we can move on from that. We're going to be at an advantage over companies who constantly hire people, because if you're hiring people, chances are they're not going to be the very best in the world at a very specific thing that happens to come up at a certain point in time. Plus, if you're hiring them, then that's a long-term hire. But if you've got a very specific thing you need done in the short term, then it pays to use external resources. That's just another thing that I think we're seeing where today's large organizations, like your Netflixes of the world, your Atlassians of the world, if you compare their market cap to say similar organizations 10 years ago, we're looking at maybe 10 times to 20 times more market cap with one tenth the number of employees. I mean, in Netflix's case, their market cap last time I checked was about 100 and 30 billion. I'm not sure how much COVID-19 has affected that, but that was just with 7,000 employees. Whereas previously, Blockbuster, their market cap was 5 billion at their peak, and they had 60,000 employees. So it's just this ability of organizations to achieve much more with much less today, providing they're intentional about how they design the way they work. Man, Steve, we're over 35 minutes and we've touched the tip of the iceberg on this book. It's jam-packed. So many great ideas. Before I cut you loose, I wanted to ask you about some of the biggest time wasters individuals could have, whether it's work or home or whatever. But I want you to leave people with a couple nuggets that they could find in your book about how to optimize their own schedules. Sure. So... People are touching their phones 2,000 times a day. They're checking email 74 times a day. We spend on average a total of six hours in our emails on a daily basis. And with our smartphones, the average person spends four hours a day on their smartphone. So that works out to about eight weeks a year. So I think that puts things into perspective for people when you break it down like that. That's eight weeks you could be investing into you know, your health, your fitness, taking up a new hobby, spending time with family, friends, rather than checking out what Arnold Schwarzenegger is talking about on Instagram today with his mules and his donkey or whatever the case may be. So I think it just requires being intentional. And the way you do that is not by using willpower because willpower is finite, particularly late at night. So late at night, we might find that when we sit down, say on the couch, it's much easier to just give in to temptation, whether that be devouring a bag of Doritos or just spending an hour scrolling on our phone when we told ourselves we wanted to read a book that night. Damn it, Steve, are you I mean, talking about me? <laughs> you you, you <laughs> like basically described my Good. evenings as of late. <laughs> no. Yeah, look, I fall victim to it all the time as well, which is why the best way to get around that is to create an environment to elicit the behavior that you want. And to do that, instead of having the phone, say, on the table, put it in another room. I mean, it sounds like it's such a simple thing, but... That requires you to get up, to go to the other room, pick up the phone, and you're going to tell yourself during that process that, hey, there's a reason why the phone is in the other room. It's because I want to focus on reading this book and I don't want to fall victim to this psychological vulnerability that I have to seeking out the dopamine hit that's going to come with jumping onto Instagram or Facebook and seeing that little red notification. The same thing goes with that bag of Doritos that I mentioned. Hey, it's going to be really hard to resist temptation late at night, but If you don't have that bag of Doritos in your house, well, then you need to get in your car, drive down to the grocery store, pick one up, and you're much less likely to do that. So whatever you find yourself wasting time with, just ask yourself, how might you create an environment whereby that time-wasting activity isn't so obvious or accessible, and therefore it's going to be much harder to waste your time doing that particular thing. Steve, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Your new book is called Time Rich, Work Smarter, Live Better. I hope people go out and get a copy. Where can they find it? And where else do you want to point people to? 
Sure. So it's been a pleasure to chat, Brandon. People can find the book on Amazon and where all good books are sold. And if they jump onto timerichbook.com, they can download the first chapter for free, as well as a PDF, which contains a whole bunch of what I call time rich tools to help people get more time back for life. Awesome. Thanks so much, Steve. Thanks, Brandon. 